Well, I think the best case for Philadelphia at three is um, is Carl Anthony Towns falling. Uh, and I just, I don't see that happening, but you're asking me the best case of still the best. Right. Outside of that, you know, I think the best fit for them, a combination of what they need, position they need, and also the highest upside is D'Angelo Russell. Um, I still believe, you know, that he's, he's probably the most likely scenario. And I do think the upside uh, and the fit to warrant that. Well, I think where I differ from some people is I do think there's a little more risk in Russell than a lot of people do. Um, you know, there's uh, some – Concerns about his athleticism and his ability to really create off the dribble and in the paint, um, really get shots, you know, create shots at a high volume and not just, you know, be a three-point shooter um, and a guy who plays off the pick and roll and a guy who plays off with Joel Embiid post, you know, post-ups and whatnot. Um, whether or not he can get into the paint and, and really finish against NBA-quality defenders. I think that's a very legitimate concern. Um, and I broke it down. I actually looked this up today. You know, he shot 59% at the rim overall in the season. That dropped to 47% when he went up against top 100 defenses. Uh, so he, he really struggled against some of the better teams. Um, but, you know, I think Philadelphia is very likely the right fit for him. You know, a lot of times we talk about guys like D'Angelo Russell and whether or not they're the right fit for Philadelphia. But I think sometimes you have to look at it as, is, is Philadelphia the right fit for D'Angelo Russell? Because for a lot of these prospects, you know, where they go and who they play with dictates a lot, a lot of times their success. And maybe not whether or not he's going to be a good NBA player or a bad NBA player, but whether he's going to be a great NBA player. And I think playing alongside a guy like Joel Embiid, you know, you look at Ohio State, and they just didn't have the other offensive options to really prevent teams from keying in on Russell, forcing him to his weak spots on the floor, and taking him out of his game. And I think if you put Russell with a guy like Embiid, who can draw a double team in the post, and who can also be a threat rolling the basket off the pick and roll, and you give defenses really have to start keying in on that, then I think it'll open up things for Russell. I think we'll be able to focus more on what he can do than what he can't do. You know, but I think for other teams, I think there's a little, like I said, a little more risk with Russell than I think some people see. But I also think Philadelphia is probably the right spot for him. Uh, before we size up the options with the third pick, let me ask you about Towns, because you said he would be the best case scenario. Are you hearing, or is there some word, Derek, that maybe the top two teams would pass on him? I would be very surprised if it's the top two teams. You know, there's still a little word out there that Minnesota might prefer Julia Loke for. I would be stunned if Towns fell to two and the Lakers didn't take him. Uh, from what I understand, they're high on him, and he's he's really a perfect fit for them and what they're looking to do and what they're looking to do both short-term and long-term. He fits with Julius Randle much better than Okafor does, who they just took seventh overall last year. To me, he would be him falling to two would be the perfect scenario for the Lakers, so I can't see them passing him up. I would be absolutely stunned. I've said this time and time again. I think Carl Towns is the best prospect in this draft. And if he falls to three, that would be just an incredible, you know, incredible luck for the Sixers. I don't see it happening, though. Um, all right. Let's write, and you wrote this over at 97.3 ESPN, about the options with the third pick. You start with Russell, and obviously – a lot of people think that he's going to be the guy. The second guy is Hazonia, and you know people don't know a heck of a lot about a whole heck of a lot about him. But is he a realistic pick at number three? You know, I think a lot of people look at him as a top five pick. Now, whether or not he's realistic at three, you know, I don't, I don't, I don't know Sam Hinkie's draft board. I wish I did. If I did, <laughs> you'd be the first to know about it. Uh, but there's probably about three or four people in the world who know Sam Hinkie's draft board. Um, whether or not he's realistic, like I said, I just don't know. I do think a lot of people around the league value him as a potential top five pick. I think it's, he was the type where if you were playing over here in the United States against college competition, I think I think people would be a lot more excited about him. I think he's a very exciting prospect, um, and I think he's he, he's a really good prospect. I think now I don't, what I where I think differentiates him from Russell is I look at his own and I see more of of I don't want to say Clay Thompson, but I'm going to, I'm going to say Clay Thompson. He's more of a number two, number three option than a number one option. I don't think you're going to look at him and say he's going to create shots not only for himself but for other people on the perimeter. I don't think that's really his game. But I think he's going to be a really good off-the-ball scorer. I think, he's, he, I think he can grow into a good defender if you can get him to really lock in on that side of the court. Uh, and I think his ability to shoot coming off the screens and shoot off the dribble, I think he's going to open things up for, for an offense. And I think it would be a good fit next to Joel Embiid. So I like him. I don't think he's going to be a number one option. I think because of that, some people might. You know, I don't think it's impossible he becomes, but you have to improve his ball handling quite a bit. So I think that might sour some people on him. 
But I think he would be a, he would be a really good fit to me, and I think he would be a really good option. All right, Christos Brzingis is a power forward. Is the potential worth it if they grabbed him at number three? He's another option with the third pick. Would his potential be intriguing enough that fans would be or should be happy if he was the guy? Well, to answer your first question, there's there's no chance fans would be happy. I mean, he's the type that you're going to bring over and he's not going to contribute this year because he's just not physically ready to do that. Um, he certainly has, again, I'm going to go top five potential. Uh, and I, I, I've heard that Sam Hinky has been over there a number of times to see him over in Sevilla personally. Um you know, but he's he's a little bit of a risky prospect. I think he has the upside to warrant a number three pick, but I think the risk. You know, if this were a different draft where maybe there weren't options alongside, like if this were last year's draft and he was going up against, you know, let's say, you know, Marcus Smart and Aaron Gordon and those type of prospects, I think he he, he could you could then justify him going ahead of those guys. But I don't think he can go up against D'Angelo Russell, um, even Mario Hazonia. Uh, Moody, I, I don't think he's going to end up going three in this draft. But I think he has that kind of upside. There's just a little bit of risk because if his frame never fills out, if he never adds that 15 to 20 pounds that he needs to add in order to be successful in the NBA, then he could, I mean, he has a little bit of an ability to be a bust. But what I will say is that we look at a lot of those guys at 18 and 19 years old, and we look at those frames, and there are so many guys that, you know, when they were that age, you read the scouting report and it said, must get stronger, must get more physical. You go back to Joaquin Noah. You go back to Tyson Chandler, and those are two of the preeminent defenders in this league. And both of them had on there, you know, they have to get stronger. They're not going to succeed. So a lot of times we look at this in five years down the line when they're 25, 26 years old and really hitting their physical prime. We wonder how this could have ever been a real concern and why he dropped in the draft. But I do think there's enough concern and there's enough other options. That I would be a little bit surprised if he went at three. But, I mean, he, he has a lot of talent as well. All right, let's go to Moutier, and I guess the question with him be, is he too much of a risk because of the lack of games that he has played to say, you know what, we're going to take him at number three, or do you think that he is a relatively safe pick? No, I think he's a relatively safe pick. I mean, look, this is a guy who's been on the um, you know, on the amateur circuit since 2012, and this is a guy that you know scouts and, and, and people around the league are familiar with. Um, 12 games, obviously you would have liked to see much more in 12 games over there in China. But I think I think people have a pretty good idea what Moody is. I think the risk with him is that his jump shot just never gets good enough. And again, I think so much is, is based around Joel Embiid. And if this were not the sick, and I think he's, he, he would be in legitimate contention for that third pick. Because I think he does a lot of things really well. I think he, he plays pick and roll well. I think he, he frankly just feels for the game and is a good passer and, and really sets up his teammates well. He pushes the ball in transition. I think he's going to be a little bit better of a defender than D'Angelo Russell. He's going to be able to get into the paint and really create opportunities. And I think he has a pretty good chance of succeeding in this league. But I don't think he's going to be a great player without a jump shot that defenders really have to focus on. And I have pretty pretty big questions about whether or not he can ever really do that. Uh, so I think I think he's a good prospect. I would have a little more interest with in him if I if I wasn't drafting for the Sixers though. All right, Derek Bodner is with us here looking at the. Uh options with the third pick he lists five of them on our website the fifth one is justice winslow and the more and i hear about him it sounds like he is becoming more intriguing to people fantastic pro, uh, prospect but too much of a long uh, of a long shot for them to take it five uh, three i mean it would be a little bit of a long shot he does fit kind of what we view as a sam hinky mold and the fact that you know he can really defend he can really push the ball in transition. He can rebound. He can contribute in a lot of different ways. And he shot 41% from three-point range, which is, you know, is a really good percentage. Uh, it wasn't on the highest amount of attempts. And you look at his, his, his free-throw shooting, and a lot of times, especially the st- statistical guys and the guys who build models like Kevin Pelton, they'll look at free-throw percentage as a bigger indicator of future jump shot success than they will even three-point shooting, usually just because it's on a much higher sample size. And his his free throw shooting was I think in the mid 60s which is a concern and he doesn't shoot much at all off the dribble he just doesn't have a pull up jump shot so I think there's some concern around his jump shot even though he shot 41% from three point range but he really has the entire package outside of that uh, he's, he's you know another one where I think he's, he probably has a pretty good chance of being a third option offensively and a really good defender and a really good you know guy who can really push the ball and create opportunities that way but I think the Sixers might be looking for a guy who's who's really going to grow into that 
number one option, or at least that primary option on the perimeter, to pair with Joel Embiid, and I'm not sure I see that in Winslow. All right, uh, you also wrote the piece about concerns and likes you had about the three big men in here. Okafor, Towns, and Porzingis uh, are the three best big men uh, in this draft. What are some of those concerns that you have about these guys? Because most people don't think those guys would be there except for possibly Porzingis, but if Okafor and Towns or Porzingis, what are some of the concerns and likes you have about these guys? Well, I mean, the concerns with Towns are, are very small and very nitpicky. Uh, you know, with Towns, he, he fouled at a high rate, very similar to, to what Joel Embiid did at Kansas. It didn't become a real issue for for Kentucky because it has such great front court depth. But he's got to, he's got to control his fouling a little bit, and he doesn't move his feet all that well in the pick and roll. Um, and again, it's not like it's it's horrible. It's not like Joel Embiid or uh, it's not like Julie Oak for on the pick and roll. But it's not Maryland's Noel defending the pick and roll either. So those are kind of two of his his weaknesses. But you call them weaknesses, and you really kind of need those air quotations that everybody hates because they're, it's really nitpicky. Um, he's just he's very versatile. He can score in the post. He can step out to 18 feet and shoot. He can pass really well. He can you know control the glass. He can dominate a game in terms of shot blocking. He's really kind of that that prototypical 2015 big man that he can really do everything and contribute on both sides of the court. To me, he would be a fantastic pairing with Joel Embiid because of, they can both dominate in the post and they can both step outside. So you can really exploit any matchup, you, any mismatch you can get in the post. Um, Okafor, again, just one of the most unique big men prospects I've ever seen, especially at his age. His footwork offensively is as advanced and his post scoring as advanced. And he really, you know, see the play develop almost like you would describe a point guard. Uh, he's just he's, he's got to be a better defender. He's got to you know rotate better defensively. He's got to be more of a presence sh- blocking shots. He doesn't defend the pick and roll well, and he doesn't really rebound on the defensive side of the court well. So if somebody can fix his defensive side of the floor, he can be a, you know just an incredibly unique and incredibly talented player. Because I have almost no question about his post game or his offensive game really translating. Um, Porzingis, incredible three point shooter, and again not only stationary where you put him in a in a spot and you kick the ball out to him, but you can run him off of the screen, which running a, a seven footer off of the screen is is kind of unique. Uh he can shoot off the dribble really well and he's got a really high release point where it's almost unguardable. Um he can block shots at the rim. He's he's really long and, and really athletic and quick. Um and he can defend the pick and roll well too. And a combination of those three those three things you don't really find all that much in big men. Um, and because of that, he'd be a great fit next to Embiid and next to Noel. You know, the, the concern is that he, he just has to add a heck of a lot of weight and, and, and strength, really. And you can see him, he can struggle at times to shoot through contact and, and really finish down low. And he can struggle to hold his position on the, on the glass as well. So that's really where he's got to, you know, improve. And again, that might be just a time thing, or he might have the kind of frame where it, it doesn't ever happen. All right, let's look at those guards, you know, the three guards that we've talked about earlier, and Moutier and Russell. You mentioned on the website right now you can look at the concerns you have for those two plus Sezonia. Of the three, which one do you have the most concern about? Uh, let's see. Of the three, I think, honestly, I think Russell might be the riskiest, but he also has most upside. Um, like I said, I think Moutier has the kind of, of game where even if he doesn't, improve as much as you would want specifically in that outside shot he's going to get in the paint he's going to be able to navigate the pick and roll and he's going to play defense so I think that kind of makes him a little less of a risk um, and his own like I said I think I think he has a pretty reasonable shot of being a good number three option at worst case scenario uh, whereas you know Russell I think he's got by far the most potential of those three but if he's not able to create off the dribble and really get in the paint he can become a little bit one dimensional and he, he probably has the weakest defensive profile of those three. So I think Russell has the most, the highest ceiling. He has the most potential. But I think he's also a little bit riskier of the three. Interesting. So what are some of the things uh, that are concerning about those three guys? You know, I, I you know I kind of agree with you with the, the uh, Russell stuff. But Moutier, it seems like he's such a because he played in China, he only played so many games, but he seems like he's got the most talent. But he, So he seems like he'd be such a wild card in this bunch. And, of course, Azonia, another guy who a lot of times the European players, the foreign players, you, you just have – there's no rhyme or reason of, of them who succeeds and who doesn't. Not that there isn't the college players either, I guess, but uh, there is no, like, discernible guy to say, this guy fits the mold. 
Uh, but Russell, too, just being a, a young freshman, all three of them obviously have big risks, but what are some of the concerns about those three guys that worry you the most? Well, I think I think with Russell, it is it is his athleticism and his, really his ability to create off the dribble consistently. Uh, whether or not he can get past that first line of defense on a consistent basis, get into the paint, and not only score for himself, but also create for others. Uh, that, to me, is his biggest concern. Uh, Moutier, it's it's always going to be that jump shot until proven otherwise. Um, he shot, you know, I think it was 57%, I want to say, from free throw line over there in China, which is obviously not a good percentage. Um, we look back at all of his tournaments in high school, and he was shooting in the 60s from the free throw line. And we're talking about, you know, 110 or so attempts. So that, that shot has always been a question mark, and it's still a very big question mark. Uh, with Hezonia, He's just got to create more off the dribble. He, he's got to get to the free throw line a little bit more, which is really tied to how much he can create off the dribble. Uh, he, he's just got to improve his ball handling and, and improve his ability to change direction and change speeds and really you know, get defenders you know, off balance and, and be able to get in the paint. He's got the quickness and the athleticism to do that. He's just kind of slowed down by his, his ball handling, so that's really what he's got to improve. All right, uh, Derek's with us here. Obviously, the NBA draft coming up in just a bit. Uh, at this point, you know, uh, the workouts and stuff, anybody gaining steam, anybody shooting up draft boards that maybe are a little under the radar? Yeah, um, I mean, there's, you know, the, the Wisconsin duo. They continue to continue to go up draft boards. Uh, Frank Kaminsky and Sam Decker, you know, I think we talked about it before there. Kaminsky has a real shot at going top ten now. Um, and and Decker looks like he's a lottery pick. And really, before before the tournament, I wouldn't have thought either one of those would have happened. Um, Cameron Payne from Murray State, he continues to look, you know, real strong. Uh, a lot of teams towards the end of that lottery really like him. Uh, Bobby Portis is a name that's that's been, you know, gaining some steam. A, a, a sophomore big man, uh, power forward from Arkansas. Not really a whole lot that you're going to look at him and go, all right, that's the number one option down the line, or he's going to be an all star, but a really strong rebounder, a strong defender, and also a guy who can who can shoot from 17 feet, but who really his game is built around hustle. Um, he's, he, he's been rising up draft boards pretty well. And Justin Anderson from Virginia, and it kind of surprises me that he ever dropped on big boards a little bit. Um, but he's, he's you know, one of the better defenders in this draft. And, you know, the type of small forward who, who's your prototypical 3 and D guy. And this year his, his jump shot went from – his three-point shooting went from like mid twenties to like mid forties in terms of percentages, and really a, a big part of that was just taking better shots. So he, he's another guy who's who's starting to you know come back up into the early twenties, and I think is is going to be a really good piece. So there's there's some movement. Uh, I wouldn't say there's a whole ton of movement. It seems like especially the top ten right now is you know there might be a little fluctuation, but it's, it's pretty well set. All right, Derek. NBA Finals Thursday night. We got LeBron versus Curry. We got the Warriors versus Cleveland. Give me your thoughts on that. Well, you know, the Warriors are just such an incredible team. Um, you know, one through eight, really, you could go. Uh, they're so deep and so talented, and they, they play both sides of the ball so well that it's really, to me, a, um, you know, I cannot speak higher of LeBron James than picking um, the, the Warriors in six. Just the fact that I think the Cavaliers could steal two games is how much I think of LeBron James and the way he's playing. Uh, I, I can't see... Cleveland having the depth and talent on both sides of the ball to really, and health really, to challenge Golden State. I think Golden State wins it. I think Golden State is, is pretty uniquely um, created to defend LeBron James. I think I think LeBron James and Draymond Green is going to be a really interesting matchup, and I think there are very few forwards like that who can match LeBron, at least in terms of, of strength and physicality, and I think that'll be fun to watch. But I would I would say Golden State in six. Golden State in six. Uh, that's uh, you yeah, know that's not a bad. I, I'm kind of in the same range. I, we'll see. I mean, but you know, any given night, if you're not shooting the ball well, LeBron can get you, and uh, that will be interesting. I would love to have seen this matchup with Love in there uh, to see how that all worked out. But I, I, I don't know what your overall view is of LeBron, but he's got two. Let me ask you this question: Who do you associate LeBron James with? Is he a Cav or a Heat? I still probably go Cavs, but I can certainly see why you would go Heat. Um, I mean, he won he won both of his titles with the Heat, so that's where you're going to naturally um, associate with him, I think. But, you know, he spent so much time in Cleveland, 
and he really, you know, he he was that entire franchise for so long. Even now, when you know a lot of he has a lot of sway in terms of uh, of player personnel and and even you know out of timeout coaching decisions, um, he was so vital for that organization. Whereas the Heat have had so much sustained su- success, you know, with Shaq and Wade and and all those teams that were based around those two. Um, there's been so much success really over the past 25, 30 years with the Heat that to me I identify uh, LeBron with Cleveland because. You know, he, he meant so much in that franchise. I think it's really interesting because when you talk about LeBron and Jordan and Bird and Magic, he's the one guy who changed teams, one at the place that maybe you don't associate him with as much, and then you know now he's back here. If he wins in Cleveland, which is like the impossible, is that almost worth like a, another championship in terms of he needs six to get to Jordan if he wins one in Cleveland, that would be his third. Would you say, you know what, that's almost worth winning two. I'm going to move you that close to closing the gap. Are you that yeah, impressed no, I mean, by him winning in Cleveland? It, it would be incredible, incredibly impressed. I mean, you look at, at even those Bulls teams, and you took Bort, Jordan off of those Bulls, and they were still a really, really good team. Uh, didn't, didn't they go to the – was it the finals they went to? They went to the Eastern Conference they Finals the one Eastern year. Eastern Conference Finals. Yeah, so they were, they were still a great team. You take LeBron off of this team. And they're, they're borderline. I mean, you know, without love and with Kyrie kind of hurt, which is really what he's dealing with right now. But you take those three guys off, and they're, they're borderline, you know, playoff team. Um, not even, really. They couldn't even make the playoffs. So with him doing it with love out and Kyrie hurt, I mean, that would be, that would be absolutely incredible. Yeah, this is and, – and, and it's an amazing – the one thing I said about LeBron, if you look at the, the, the stats and say, all right, pick a guy, you, you can't pick the wrong guy in terms of LeBron, Jordan, if you're going in that range. But, you know, you look at Jordan doing it all in, in Chicago, then leaving and coming back and winning more. You know, I said what LeBron did is almost like Jordan saying, I can't beat the Pistons, so I'm going to go play with Larry Bird in Boston, win my championships there. What we think of Jordan as the same. That's what I think – where LeBron is kind of at right now and why I think it's so important for him to win these in Cleveland to kind of say, you know what, I got – even though he was the man in Miami, to do it where he is unquestionably the guy on the team that drafted him I think would be a huge boost for him. Yeah, no doubt. And, I mean, it would – you know, some, sometimes these debates between, you know, is is LeBron Jordan. And sometimes <laughs> I almost think that we just lose sight of how great LeBron is. Like, he might not be Jordan. But he's still really incredible and really fun to watch, and and I, I certainly appreciate watching him and, and and watching what he's been able to do. I mean, when was the last time he wasn't? You know, this is what the fifth straight year or the sixth straight year he's been five in a row, five in a row, and he's been I think six of the last nine years he's been in the finals. He's made the Eastern Conference Finals I think I think going on ten years in a row now. So what he's been able to do, and yeah, that's been in the Eastern Conference. So you almost have to put an asterisk next to it. But what he's been able to do has been incredible. It's just been, it's been a great time to be an NBA fan. It really has. It's been a lot of fun, you know, watching him mature. I thought uh, he has matured a lot, and I definitely think he's playing some of his best. Uh, would have loved to have seen Love to make this thing, you know, as strong as it can be. But I think we got the best final that we could have had at the beginning of this thing. The Western and Eastern Conference playoffs both duds. We hope to get good hoops starting Thursday. We get good Sixers coverage from Derek Bodner at Derek Bodner NBA on Twitter. Thank you, Derek. Thank you. All right.